Welcome everybody. I am so excited that you are joining us today because we have an exceptional show with exceptional leaders. Today we are going to feature Ingrid Jacobs. She is the former Global Head of Diversity and Inclusion at JLL and truly a domain expert globally in the topic. We're going to learn a lot from her. And with her, we have Charlotte Farmer, Dr. Charlotte Farmer, who is the Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Underwriters Laboratories. She also has immense experience in this space, and we are going to learn about DEI in large organizations. I hope you stay with us for the whole show, and remember to put in your questions. We'll try and answer them live on the show. I'm Lorreen Siegel. I'm the Chairman, Founder, and CEO of the Exceptional Women Awardees Foundation. We enable high-level women, just like Ingrid and Charlotte, to rise to meet their dreams. Why did I start this foundation? Well, I never had a mentor. All through my early career as a lawyer and then as a CEO of a number of companies, even as a board director, I never had a guide to enable me to really know the way and the direction that I should be taking. And I wanted to be sure that women who walk the road less traveled, as I have and Ingrid and Charlotte as well, would always have a network of women leaders to surround them and enable them to reach their dreams. And that's exactly what we do at EWA. So without further ado, let's get into our program and let me introduce Ingrid and Charlotte. Welcome, ladies. I'm going to go straight to my first question, and that is for you, Ingrid. You have an amazing career, and now to reach this pinnacle of expertise, talk about when you were a little girl. Did this come into your head about going to be a corporate executive in a large organization? Uh, I can't say that I even knew what a large organization was when I was a little girl, but um, I did luckily have a lot of support in my family to make sure that I knew from the beginning, um, like other little girls, you know, if you have the tenacity and the interest, go do. I had a really strong backdrop uh, and a good family upbringing that made it easier for me to dream big. And um, my dreaming big equated to getting a job. Step one, graduated from college, getting my master's, all those key things that are essential as you progress. But it also meant that um, I was willing to take a chance and be in a topic that not necessarily everybody jumps up and down and excited about. Um, so having to be able to have that confidence to be able to talk about topics that aren't necessarily ones where, again, there's a lot of interest and uh, desire to want to dig in a little bit deeper. So that has been to me um, a part of that path and that uh process to really start to think about what's next what could we do if we start to bring in more people into the equation for a really rich dialogue what do we have to do to build a more trusting environment so people feel like they can be who they really are and be authentic and really feel valued at the firm so those are some of the things that i think about uh, as my journey when i was young did i know it no uh, as i progressed uh, i started to become more aware well so what did you study at college what, what was it that gave you that innovative approach? Um, you know, as an undergrad, believe it or not, I was an agricultural business uh, degree. For those of you that know me, Lorraine teases me about my um, the number of ball gowns that I have. To see me in agribusiness uh, is quite the stretch, but that is what I got my undergrad in. And uh, my graduate degree is human resource development at, at Xavier. Wow, fantastic. And so Charlotte, it's not much different for you because you always had a purpose-driven, mission-driven life. So tell us a little bit about the early years. Lorraine, I'll try to do this without crying because I'm so grateful to so many people. I didn't realize how poor we were because mother would always say yes to everything, Lorraine. She would say, absolutely, you can have this as long as you're willing to work for it. She would also say, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. What she was talking about 50 years plus ago, she was talking about innovation. And so I learned early, if there was something I wanted really badly, I had to invent it. I had to create it. If there wasn't a space at the table, guess what? I had to bring a chair and, and create that. I grew up in a library that showed me the world and what life could be. And at the same time, like I said, I didn't even realize I was growing up in a, a gang-ridden neighborhood. 
literally. And so when I look back on it, Lorraine, I just know that uh, the world, the universe wanted to see this little girl succeed. Fortunately, like I said, from a very large family, I had sisters and brothers who traveled the world, who gotten their degrees, and I could look to them as luminaries for what life could be. And so as I pivoted throughout my career, I intentionally created a board of trustees that helped me balance physical, spiritual, intellectual, professional, financial, and just social impact throughout my career. And I still use that board of trustees to guide me. And one thing I've learned from this diversity perspective, Lorraine, my board of trustees does not look like me, does not think like me, and certainly stretches and ensures I'm not too comfortable at any one time. So this little poor girl, let me tell you, she's still stretching, she's still growing, she's still uncomfortable, and candidly, I like to keep it that way. No, oh, that's remarkable. And, and to our audience, you have a unique opportunity to speak directly to these amazing leaders. And I encourage you, please tell us where you come from, but put in your questions and we'll try to answer them as much as we can. So back to you, Ingrid, for a moment. You know, one of the things that I love about you both, in fact, is that you have a great executive presence. Was that something someone taught you, Ingrid, or would you just grow up with it or was it in your family? How did you create that amazing presence? Um, you know, when I am around uh, groups of women like the exceptional women that our group is, uh, I feel like it almost gets brighter, if that makes any sense. Uh, you get around people and you feed off of their personalities. But growing up, I, I, I want to describe it as, again, I talked about that underpinning. And for some of us in the audience, some folks had that and it's, it's a blessing and then others did not. But I always looked to people who were potentially, don't want to say the underdog, but people who didn't feel like they had someone to speak on their behalf. And it almost lit a fire under me to make sure that I listened, actively listened to what the needs are and then tried to do my very best to speak for them or to provide them a space to get in front of the people that needed to hear from them. And that executive presence, I think, comes from just simply knowing that if, if I don't say or do something and I have the power to be able to, um, it's, that's, that's too much of a shame. I, I, I wouldn't want to live knowing that I didn't do enough for folks myself and or for them. So that's part of how I feel like I build this acumen over the years. You just get bolder when you realize what's at stake and who, who may not have a chance. And if I don't speak up, it may never be heard. Well, you know, Ingrid and, and Charlotte, both of you, I would say, are women of courage. And uh, it's taken a lot of courage to bring about the change that you know has to happen in organizations. And so, um, Ingrid, I'm going to go back to you for a moment because, you know, DEI, all of a sudden it's hot. You've lived it all your life. What is there that you did early on that you have seen has changed both for the better and for the worse in the present day about DEI? Um, I think they typically in my office behind me, you can't see it, but there's like a little easy button. And that button is what people typically want to move forward with as it relates to DEI actions. You know, hey, if we've got diversity inclusion, you know, smack, let's hit it when, let's hire, let's go to colleges and hire that talent, or let's get a mentorship program, both of which are very foundational and essential. But there is almost this um, inordinate amount of interest in that space because it's something people can tangibly understand and conceptually get, and they believe that will take it to the significant amount of success. And ultimately, it just means you have more diverse interns and you might have diverse interns with mentors, but you haven't moved the needle in a major way and people get frustrated because they've had a lot of activity. So from that perspective, I see that as a part of maybe some of the things that still happen from the past and that it would be great if um, we moved on from that. But there's other areas where I see a lot of success. There's a lot more people feeling very emboldened. Young Gen Z population is feeling a lot more 
able to speak freely about what they care about and what they'd like to see in the future. So that part is the other side of that spectrum of what I see that's new and powerful and different in the space of DEI. Lower tolerance for waiting for change to happen. Well, that's certainly something that gives us a little bit of hope. So Charlotte, again, you've lived DEI, you know, for, for people, it's a process, you've lived it all your life. Tell us a little bit about what your perception is about how it was and how it is now. Right, and I'm happy to talk about that. L Lorraine, in the early days, a chemical engineer by training, typically you find yourself in the South near a river. In my case, I was half the age of individuals who I was leading, and I didn't look like anyone that I was leading. And I can tell you with uh, great uh, authenticity that I was afraid to go to work. My life was threatened. So can you imagine being the best that you can possibly be when your life is at risk? Think about that and just let that wash over you. Now, the good news is this. Throughout my career, as I was pivoting, there were individuals who engaged, who provided that peak around the corner that showed me what could be. And the other thing about being ninth of 10 kids, there's this sense of grit and stick to itness and just not giving up. And what I would call loving the hell out of some people. And as a result, great things happened. The individuals who were threatening my life literally became advocates as I was building intelligent manufacturing facilities to save lives and moving from building those intelligent manufacturing facilities to save life to building businesses that advise technology leaders in developing weapon systems. And so here I find myself again in a situation where I'm the only one of my kind. And so that shift from in your face uh, being different was more subtle in the way you're engaged. And so guess what, Lorraine, you mentioned to me one day, you said, Charlotte, why did you get a PhD? Lorraine, that's why I got the PhD. I studied to prove myself worthy to honor my clients. At that time, I was building a billion dollar business to engage uh, scientists. And I wanted them to know when I step in the room, I understand and acknowledge their mission and I'm a part of it. And then I had to reinvent myself again. And the notion of diversity became, as I was building coalitions to keep the world safe and the transportation, excuse me, the transportation security area. Again, it wasn't that in your face of uh, physical or visceral and it wasn't that subtle around um, education. It became mission driven. Are you a part of this mission? Can we count on you to deliver impactful outcomes? So that whole journey of diversity from an individual perspective is not lost on me. Amazing. You know, what you remind me of both of you is Nelson Mandela. Uh, <laughs> as you know, I come from South Africa, but Nelson Mandela uh, after he was uh, freed and, and became the head of the country, instituted a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And that's where the accused and the accusers met. And what you mm -hmm. said, Charlotte, is you, you love them to death. You love them into becoming advocates. And, you know, it takes a Mandela kind of approach to life, uh, which both of you have obviously developed, to take a peaceful approach to conflict and evolve it into collaboration. Amazing, and I admire you both so much. So, so Ingrid, back to you for a moment. You know, you said something a little, a few moments ago about move the needle. Can you give us a few more beats on that? What would move the needle be to you as a global diversity domain expert and a leader in that? What, what does it mean to you to move the needle? Um, it, it means a lot of things and, and I don't want to, don't want to not answer your question, Lorraine, but just to build on Charlotte's remarks earlier, when I was talking about having those moments where you have to speak for someone else, imagine Charlotte 
multiplied by thousands of people. The role that I handle is trying to listen to their stories authentically, help them navigate so that they still feel heard and seen, and not send, sell them a bill of goods so they feel like we're just putting systems and programs in place that aren't necessarily gonna get at the core of, I'm afraid for my life, how am I gonna survive this next day? So I, I, I just, the power in her words are so, it's so important, but it's also important for us to realize that this role tries its very best to be on both sides of the spectrum, listening to the circumstances of individuals like Charlotte, but also listening to the business leaders and trying to help drive back to that point of moving the needle. So the move the needle work is involved in the fact that we see different representation at the top. And for a lot of people, they say, well, that's such a simplistic answer. Yes, it is. The many of the things that we do is uh, very basic in nature, meaning if you have, if you can see it, you can be it all the way through those letters of the rungs of success to be at the top leader level, you need to be able to see instances of people thriving, not just surviving and being in those roles. It's really important to understand the systems and processes to which an organization runs its, its, um, it's human capital, meaning the promotion rates, what's going on with the exit interviews, all those things that are part of your usual regular parts of HR, those are really important to make sure you're taking a really fine tooth comb to understanding them. It takes active listening to diverse populations to actually hear what it is that they need and want, not just prescribe bodies of work on them or try to fix them. I know women um, in the workplace have long since been people who are receiving benefits, maternity or otherwise, that weren't even necessarily drawn up by by people who have had a baby or have had leave or all of those things that are important. So having representation on different parts of the processes that is a lot more diverse so that you can have systems and processes that make sense so that you can really start to see again in a very real level sustained change. You've got metrics, you've got consequences to not achieving metrics, you've got incentives. All of those things are a part of a, a web, but I, I will tell you in my years of doing this work, there is this unspoken desire or belief that people think it's a, a silver bullet out there, where it's gonna be, if we just get that one thing, or if they just figure crack that one code, the insidiousness of what you have in most organizations is it's a million codes and the recombinants are ever happening in the sense that you get a new leader, they have different things that are important to them or different ways that they lead. You also have new employees, they switch and move about. Sometimes people have different dimensions of diversity they care about more or more willing to accept. You, mean, you might be talking to someone who's a champion around women's issues, but when you bring up LGBTQ, they're like, eh, this makes me uncomfortable, so I'm not gonna be there the way I would otherwise or people with different abilities. All those things make it so incredibly difficult that it can be very hard to move the needle. And that's why you have to keep pressing the same buttons, but also be willing to listen and try something new and different and leverage the actual diversity at the table to help derive the best solutions. So I'm hoping that wasn't too confusing of an answer, but it's- That was, yeah, that was, exa that was exactly what I wanted to hear. But more important than that, you know, I hope a lot of organizations are listening to this because actually, Ingrid, you are an incredible consultant to organizations who have DEI missions because you know how to do it from the detail point of view to the strategy. Yeah. And I think when strategy becomes implemented the way you have discussed it, you actually can move the needle. Absolutely. I want to go back to you for a moment, Ingrid, because you are a global diversity leader and that's the part that I find incredibly fascinating. Talk about the global aspect of your expertise for a moment. Yeah, um, I think what's fascinating around the global piece is, and, and I will be so humble and vulnerable to saying, learning diversity means in each region, each location, each country, it can be totally different. And that's what's, uh, it, it's a serious eye opener because something in one country that isn't that big of a deal potentially um, in a secular country like the United States, you know, different dimensions of or sectors of religion may not be a big a deal versus you go somewhere else and it's the only deal. Religion is what carries the day and it's how people think about their lives and, and the constructs of how they engage with different people. And then you go somewhere else where people with a different ability or, or a disability, they are perceived as invisible. They're so unseen, they are invisible. 
So it, it, you show up. And one of the things I think as I've been doing this work for a while is I try my very best to figure out ways to break bread. And let's say we're in the middle of a pandemic. How do you break bread with people to get to know them, to be vulnerable, share what you don't know, what you do know, and to try to build relationship across the board? Because I can, I can tell you, I don't, I understand the package that I am in, meaning I have many dimensions of diversity um, that I encapsulate. I am a woman. I am um, a, you know, heterosexual, able-bodied Christian individual. These are all the things that I am an American. When I show up to a table, it's going to have different constructs. And I have to recognize all that, that um, emboldenedness that I spoke about before in some countries may definitely not carry the day and actually may inhibit me from building a bridge. So I have to think about all those things when I think about global diversity. It's important to factor that. Yeah, absolutely. I think you mentioned something about you were talking about women of color or person of color, and then you got corrected. Could you just give us that little incident? Quick? Yes. Um, so in my career, uh, you know, you will be using vernacular to which you're accustomed and what your audience is accustomed. And then uh, at one point I was talking to some folks in another region and they were like, you know, people of color, women of color, that's that's considered uh, fairly offensive. So you need to. And I said, you know, excuse me, I'm so sorry. And they basically corrected me. But that correction comes from trust being built for them recognizing that I look and seek to learn and not that they would offend me. And then therefore the relationship be severed. And that to me is a part of why I love doing this work because someone has to trust you in order to want to give you that type of advice. They could just let you keep bungling around and offending people. Or they could say, hey, I just wanted to let you know that that's something that people may find offensive. And, and actually in this region, we say BAME. And this is what it means and this is why we say it. And I say, okay, got it, thank you. And I lean into, hey, I tell that story of vulnerability with other people, not to ex exhibit, you know, hey, she doesn't know everything, which I don't, but mostly to exhibit, if your head of diversity is fallible, meaning can make mistakes, it certainly gives a lot more grace for people feeling like, hey, I don't have to be perfect to try to do something in the space of diversity and inclusion. I can show up as I am with an open heart willing to learn and then just try to keep moving and trying to be a part of the change I want to see. So that's a little bit of what we try and do. But yeah, that course correction, I was like, oops, <laughs> apologies, didn't know. And I just tried to keep moving, um, but use that as a lesson, a good one. And I, I think there are a lot of us who, who, who have that same situation and, and are happy to be educated. I think we have a bunch of questions which we've been holding off of because this was such a powerful conversation. So let's bring Let's bring in one question and, and uh, Nima. Oh, well, this is a nice, easy question for us, which is uh, Nima from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Thanks, Nima. How do you both keep healthy with such stressful jobs? And of course, hopefully you have families, which you can tell us a minute about, and community activities, which of course everybody knows you're involved. They just have to Google both of you. Okay, so Ingrid, you go first. Um, yeah, so I am... We have a new puppy, um, and so I'm walking a lot more often than I probably would have otherwise. And I actually use uh, the image products uh, a lot. So for my face, anyway, that's what I've been doing. The rest of me uh, <laughs> is always uh, some meditation, deep breathing, and just trying to stay um, focused on what do I do for self-care, getting my hair done, getting my nails done, um, just trying to do a little bit just to kind of depressurize to make sure that I don't get to a point where um, things get a little bit too far gone. So that's a big thing for me is just trying to keep an even keel and, and to stay uh, happy. So I, I work on those small things and so far uh, so good and wherever I can volunteer through the organization, um, my, my company and the different volunteer opportunities we have, those are also ways that I help um, as a way to giving back. But yeah, that's me. You look great, Ingrid. So. Um... <laughs> We're almost at the end of our show. So Charlotte, just give us your secret sauce of how you look so fabulous and keep healthy. I can't tell you, whatever she said. No, I, I love to eat. And the thing about my relationship with food, I love food and it loves me back. I eat and it never leaves. So the best I can do is eat my vitamins. That's what my daughter tells me to do. She's like, mom, since you're just not going to cut down on the calories, make them count. And so I've been 
cognizant of anything that goes into my temple. Like, you know, I've got this bodybuilder sign. Your body is your temple. So <laughs> I'm careful about what goes into the temple. Ingrid has a puppy. I got a COVID puppy. A full vulnerability here, ladies. Working from home, I just started observing all of the things that I hadn't done. So I got Theodore Augustus Farmer, better known as Teddy, a terror puppy. And that kid, he keeps me going. So when I'm not binge watching period pieces or reading things that keep me stretching and growing, I'm trying to keep up with Teddy. Well, it sounds like you both have things to do. Let's see if we can maybe get one more quick question up here. And uh, hopefully, oh, here's Tasha from Buffalo, New York. Ingrid, your role was global. What are the differences, if any, that you see outside the USA uh, to diversity? So Ingrid, I know you answered this question somewhat, but just give us one example that comes to you from your huge experience. Um, let's see here. I can think of um, some progress we've made from the LGBT standpoint as it relates to globally, just trying to really see and open our minds. Like I, I mentioned just briefly, in some countries, um, LGBT community is persecuted to the point of almost death. So there's a sense of safety, back to what Charlotte was talking about earlier, that people have to factor in. So you could be out, quote unquote, at work, um, and that could cause you great harm um, externally uh, of your job. So it's always being cognizant of how do we provide great programming and awareness within different firms that I've worked in, but also how do you think about the psychological and physical safety of your employee base once they leave that work environment? People that they work with go to their same synagogue or mosque or church or grocery store, and how do you make sure that they still feel safe when they do that? So those are elements of things that, that pop into my mind when I think about that difference of how it may be from the USA to around the globe. It's an immense, immense responsibility that we have uh, in the global area. There's no doubt about it. I wish we had more time, ladies. We've got so much more to discuss. And hopefully we'll, we'll come back and do another show on this topic because we have a lot to learn, a lot to, to teach each other and also to gain from our audience. So thank you again for your insights. You've taught me a lot and hopefully our audience as well. But of course, we're not done because we have another show coming up very soon. And this is going to be with Carrie Jean Glosser, KJ, she's known as. And she is um, a partner at Abacus Wealth Partners. They are a socially conscious wealth management firm. Very interesting what they invest in. And you're going to learn a lot from her, too. In addition, we have Janice Burlingham, and she is the chief financial officer of Aptera. Aptera is an early stage solar powered electric car company. Look out, Elon Musk. Both of them are highly accomplished executives. And what's more interesting is that they have both done graduate degrees while they are running these C-level jobs. Very interesting how you do that. It's not easy. I did it myself and it's pretty exhausting, but we're going to learn their techniques from them on the next show. And in the meantime, I'm going to leave you with a question. Hopefully you will answer it to my email, which is going to be on the screen momentarily. And the question is, what kind of DEI programs do you have in your organization? And if it's a large organization, we'd love to learn from you. There's always lots to learn about how you're doing things, hopefully in a great way. And of course, we want to be sure that you go on to Amazon Music and to Spotify and our YouTube channel. We want you to share our program, tell everybody about it, and hopefully join us next time. Thanks for being with us, everyone. Bye-bye. See you next week.